Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Lee Montville, and I'm the Director of Special Sales and Business Development at Springer Publishing. Today, we are presenting Clinical Instructor Life Lessons, Nursing Wisdom as a Nurse Educator with Eden Zavit Khan, instructor in the Foundations of Nursing Practice courses at the College of Southern Maryland, and Susan Stabler Haas, clinical instructor at Villanova University in Pennsylvania. Both Eden and Susan are authors of the recently published Fast Facts for the Clinical Nursing Instructor, fourth edition. Before we get started, I want to mention that this webinar is being recorded. And if you miss any portion of the presentation, you'll be able to find the video on springerpub.com five to seven business days post-event. If you have any questions today during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box on your Zoom control panel, and I'll bring them up at the end of the presentation. And if you forget to ask a question, there'll be a brief survey sent at the end of the webinar, and you can include your question there. Now, without further ado, we will turn over the time to Eden and Susan. Thank you, Lee. Hi, I'm Susan, and I will begin the webinar. And after my section's finished, Eden will take over. Well, just first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming and also thank you for being clinical nursing instructors and thinking about it. It's a very rewarding job, very challenging, and it's really important that you're interested in doing this. So some of the learning objectives we hope to achieve today is we hope that you can learn a few helpful tools to transition to the role of clinical instructor. Um, it is a transition and we will address different tools that we have found useful that you could start using today or tomorrow and also to help you navigate the challenges of the student mental health scenarios. Mental health in the whole world has become more of a topic, at least it's being discussed, which I think is a great um, change, but our students come to us with their own mental health issues, and while we're not responsible as clinical instructors, it does affect our job, and so we just will talk about different ways we have handled some of the challenges we hope you also gain insight on aspects of being a clinical instructor. And lastly, we will discuss various scenarios and how best to manage them with a lot of case samples, case studies to be able to talk about what we've experienced and what seems to work and doesn't work. But since this is nursing and you are all educators, uh, let's begin with a poll, and we want you right now to answer the question, must I be friends with my students? Choice A, yes, it's the key to success. B, sometimes if I like the student. C, only the students with A averages. And D, no, friendships with students during your teaching role can be problematic. So we invite you just to answer that question very quickly, and then we'll discuss what we think is the correct answer. Okay, so it looks like most people said D, you were all correct, and let me just briefly explain why D is the correct answer. Yes, it's key to success. You can be friendly with your students, not friends. You are in a very important position of being the clinical uh, instructor, you evaluate the students, and safety for the patient is really your most important role. So being friends can be very difficult if issues come up. Um, I am friends with some students I've taught, but it is after I've been a clinical instructor with them. Often students will reach out to you after your time teaching them. They would like you to be a mentor, they will continue to ask you for letter references. And there are a few I am still friends with from like 15, 20 years ago, but not during your time teaching them. It's really wrought with a lot of issues. So thank you for the, the poll and for your opinions. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. That's what I'm trying to do. 
we said before this started to be prepared for issues and there there's one okay so i'm going to read from my book since i'm having a little trouble reading that quote at the top at the very top it says a quote the dream begins with a teacher who believes in you who tugs and pushes and leads you to the next plateau sometimes poking you with a sharp stick called truth you may hear that one line by Dan Rather and think, well, I'm not going to poke anyone with a sharp stick. That's not going to be me. Let me explain why I like that quote so much uh, to describe some of your role as a clinical nursing instructor. Of course, you start out with compassion. That's what got you into nursing. But you are teaching these new students, these new nurses, how to be so agile with their ability to constantly take in new information to change their plan for the day and truth always is at the top of your list but you are the person bridging the gap between the ideals taught in the classroom and the realities of everyday nursing which you're all very aware of so sometimes you do need to poke and push and have the student think about the next step Yes, their blood pressure is 150 over 90. Let's look at what could be the issue. Is it a red alert? Did they get their blood pressure pills already this morning? Oh no, it's two hours late for their blood pressure pills. Maybe it's as simple as let's give them their blood pressure pills. That is your job. You're bridging the gap between truth and reality. And sometimes you do need to poke a bit. Technical proficiency alone in your students, as you know, will not make a good nurse. Sometimes the students I've had the most challenge with are A students, A students in the classroom. They have great difficulty, not all, just a few, who great difficulty translating all the information from the classroom to the clinical site. So don't be fooled by their classroom grades alone. Look individually at how they are performing in with the patient. And it's a big responsibility you have, but it's also very rewarding. And that is part of the reason we wrote our book here today. So how do you communicate with Generation Z? That's who we're teaching now. They're somewhere between the ages of 12 and maybe 27. So it's been a transition for me. I don't know about you. What is the transition? Well, I usually send emails with all the information the students need. Your employer and the hospitals will be telling you different things the students need to complete before their first day of the clinical site. So you, of course, will email them. You'll get their names, you'll email. But over the last few years, I'm finding I don't get answers right away. Or when I say this is due in say a week, I don't get the response. So I've been thinking and reading about Generation Z finding emails is not emails or not their favorite form of communication. So what I started in the fall, which really seems to help is I sent a one line message email. It says, I am Susan Stabler Haas. I'm your clinical nursing instructor. If this is correct, if this is the information you have, email me immediately. No, I don't say email. I say, please contact me via my cell phone. And I do give them my cell phone number. Then I have found I immediately get a response within 24 hours and I have their cell phone number. Then when I send my emails with important information, I do text them and say, hey, by the way, there's information you need to complete by this date. Please look on your email. That's helped me a lot. And Generation Z likes to work as a team. You probably have found that out. So we have some expectations the students need to do before their first day of clinical. Sometimes they have to prepare some medication sheets. So we have been allowing them to work together in pairs to prepare those sheets and it's medications they need to give or be aware of during the clinical area and time. And so we allow them to work in pairs in the very beginning. It really seems to help the cohesiveness of the clinical group. And 
we also think to communicate with Generation Z that they are a guest at the clinical site. It's great they're in nursing, it's great they're at the hospital, but they are guests. As you all know, it's getting more difficult to get clinical sites for students. We really have to be on our best behavior. What does that mean, we are guests? They really should not be hanging out the nurse's station. That is the nurse's space. I always ask the nurses, where can the students go? What computer can they use to retrieve the information for their patients? Most of the time they'll say, that computer there, we really only want one or two at a time to be at the desk. I really would encourage you to communicate that to Generation Z. I did a very informal poll of many students to ask, what do you want in a clinical nursing instructor? And it boiled down to the acronym, acronym CAP, Consistency, Approachability, Proficiency. Be consistent. We're all human. You may like student A much more than student B, but you have to have the same expectations and treatment for A and B because they compare. Approachability, as I said, you don't have to be their best friend, but you need to be approachable. Even though inside you could be screaming about something and wanting to say, we discussed that 300 times. Try not to say it, it's very hard. Repeat it again and try to stay calm. You'll get much more information that way. And proficiency. I don't mean you need to be the expert in everything on the clinical unit. The nurses are there. But have some clinical nursing experience before you go into this role. Because the students will know if you don't and you'll feel much better about yourself. We wrote a new chapter for this book about student mental health. So I'd like to talk briefly about student resilience and your own self-care. And first, I'm going to talk about self-care. You are a role model for your students. You, how you care for yourself during the day, will communicate how important that is. And why is that important? You need to have focus. During the day, you have constant information coming to at you. So take lunch yourself. Many people say, I can't take lunch by myself. I'm lucky if I can eat a banana during the day. Don't do it. 20 minutes, go off the unit. Tell the nurse, tell the students, at 12 o'clock, I'm leaving the unit for 20 minutes. Yes, you will be behind. You may not even have finished all the medications, but I can guarantee you, especially those of you doing 12-hour clinicals, those 20 minutes away from the unit where you're just recharging your brain will pay great dividends. You need to learn to focus and you need to take a break and then you're teaching your students how important that is. Meditation, I meditate about 10 minutes before all clinical days and sometimes for three minutes during my 20 minute break. Nothing fancy, just concentrating on my breath for two minutes it can recharge and refocus your brain. Relaxing size we're going to do together at the end of this slide. Establish boundaries on day one. What do I mean? I am available for your questions. From this time to this time, every clinical day, I can speak to you during that day. If it's imperative for you to reach me immediately, never uh, only do that during the hours of 9 a.m., 5 p.m. That's an example of a boundary. In your emails, let the students know. Give me at least 24 to 48 hours to get back to you. Many of you have other jobs. You are not available. They may not realize everything else that you were doing. Document and copy superiors for self-care. Eden will speak a little bit more about that. Keep a log. Definitely brief notes. You don't know when you may have to go back to your question, go back to that clinical day because somebody said something happened. Doesn't have to be a long book, just a word or two. 
And remember, as you're working with students who may come to you and on the first day say, well, I have anxiety and I can't do this. And my therapist said this and that. You are not their therapist. If they present to you with a real issue, I had a student who said, I'm in the middle of changing my medications for my anxiety. And sometimes I can't concentrate during the clinical day. I just thought you should know that. And it was med surge, acute med surge. I told my uh, coordinator immediately, we asked the student to go to the counseling center and get a written clearance that she was able to take care of patients in a student role, give medications, et cetera. Okay, that's just one example of some of the issues that may come up. And this website at the bottom is something that you can use for yourself. It has a free uh, example of all kinds of meditations you can do. And like I said, we are going to end this slide and then Eden will join us to discuss more information. But before we do that, we together are going to take three relaxing sighs. So, as you all know, your breathing pattern changes when you're anxious. Like mine right now is a little more rapid and a little more shallow than it usually is. But when Eden takes over and I relax, it will be a little deeper and a little slower. So we are going to use our breathing to change and decrease our stress level. So we'll do this together. If you want to close your eyes, you're welcome to do it. It's not necessary. So picture yourself in the middle of a busy clinical day. You feel your blood pressure going up. You're going to take three relaxing sighs. You're going to breathe in through your nose. And out through your mouth, a gentle, relaxing sigh. In through your nose, gentle, relaxing sigh. In through your nose, gentle, relaxing sigh. In through your nose, gentle, relaxing sigh. Do that often, teach it to your students when they feel anxious, teach it to your patients. And it really, if you check in with your body, you may notice a lot more of a relaxed feeling. So now I'm gonna turn our webinar over to Eden. Thank you, Sue. And Sue, if you don't mind controlling the slides, thank you so much. Now that we're all uh, relaxed a little bit, um, I just want to give you a little bit of um, an item to do, if you don't mind typing in in the chat room there, resources. So I want to sit here for a little bit on the slide for us to think about our resources, who can support us. So I'm going to give you a little background and, and our little story of how Sue and I um, got into our path in this journey of being clinical faculty. And I'd like you, if you are maybe just starting or if you haven't started for a brand new faculty, less than two years, write that down. I'm just curious who our audience is. But I want you to know that I believe, and I know Susan firmly believes this too, our job as a clinical faculty, as a clinical instructor, is 10 times, 20 times more challenging, more difficult than being sitting in front of a classroom and giving out a lecture on vital signs. I want you to know that this role, when Susan and I did this, and Sue, it was decades ago in the 1990s, we were thrown into the role, didn't have a book, didn't have a, now there are faculty academies I hear on clinical faculty roles. I know um, there are adjuncts being onboarded in addition to full-time faculty, it's happening now. Um, schools are paying attention to adjuncts, which most clinical instructors are. You come in as an adjunct in a part-time, limited hours role. You're not taking a full-time role, but you are considered part of the academic team. They're full-timer and part-timers. I also know the audience in front of us, you are coming from a school, two-year, four-year, various schools out there for nursing. Um, and we welcome you. But resources, my resource after a long clinical day with a clinical issue, 
for a lot of um, my uh, challenging times and just running something around and, and couldn't figure it out because I couldn't get hold of somebody was Sue. So write down if you can, and if you are, and I see here, it's some of you are brand new, less than two. Who do you think? Someone wrote their, their clinical faculty coordinator. Um, I see a lot. There are first year. I'm going through the chats now, re reading through. Um, I knew I shouldn't have done that. It's okay. So <laughs> that's okay. Resources. I see. Um, did anyone write down a handbook? A nursing student handbook. That's a resource. You have to know your policies. You are accountable. Students are more accountable, but you're you have to kind of guide them. I teach first year now. I've taught fourth year, graduating now in a first year in a two year program, and these are first year students who are just being introduced to a handbook. Course programs, yes. Faculty resources, textbooks, yes, handbooks. These are resources, but sometimes the textbooks don't have that answer. There, and, and Sue and I, we talk regularly. We also talk about how, again, we're unfortunately been doing this a long time. So we're more experts, if you want to call us. And, and you know, no matter what, students have changed. We, we see that. The agencies, our clinical practice settings have changed, correct? Our patients, the dynamic, they're always changing. So we need a set guideline, and that guideline is your handbook. We always have to know our policies. Now, somebody, see, I see here a clinical instructor manual. Blessings to your institution who has that. That is very hard to even find. Um, not a lot of schools have those. And, and you all will find each school, each program. I've taught at three different programs, so many different uh, agencies. Everybody's different. The one true thing that you're going to have is a maybe a guideline, maybe one page outline. They'll give you a name of a supervisor. The supervisor could be a course coordinator. And then the third most important, our Bible, and I've said it again, is the handbook. I also like that someone wrote other educators, other mentors, people. That's my favorite, is just putting things down and giving someone a call. If you have, um, we learned this being working, uh, most of us maybe have transitioned from being a staff nurse in the hospital settings or practice settings. We always had someone who was a role model or a mentor. If you have that, fantastic. But you would need someone like that who has been an educator, who is familiar. I work currently in a program with multiple, so I work as part of a course team. My course team is composed of three to six faculty. There could be full-timers and part-timers. And I'm usually going to someone who I know has been teaching a long time, who has seen some of this, I mean, experiences. I. I could have a student, we'll go through one of the last slides we have is different scenarios and we'll invite you when we get there to give us your student scenarios because to me, that is the most challenging. There is not a resource that I have ever seen that will give you the answer for every single clinical issue. It's impossible. Um, I've had students late for 10 different reasons, right? I forgot to get gas. I, uh, my alarm didn't wake me up. My mother, father, brother, someone who was supposed to, excuse me, wake me up, didn't wake me up. Um, there was a fourth, fifth, sixth, there's gonna be various reasons. I was uh, carpooling with another person and there was an incident, we got lost. I had a student with clear directions. We get, got over the, all the information and we gave that kind of mentioning what Sue said about communication path. We sent the directions in an email. We posted directions to a learning management system, sent their directions in a third path, in a text, a group text. The students wanted to do a group text. Do you know that student and, and two other people in the car went to the wrong place? So we can do our best, but things happen. So this, the first thing, if you are new, some of you are looking through the chat, less than two years, some of you are embarking in this 
wonderful role. It's a fantastic role. It is most challenging. I will refute anyone who thinks the theory is more challenging, giving exams. I think being a clinical faculty, an instructor in a vast, changing, ever-practice environment that we're always experiencing, to me, is one of the most most difficult, most challenging. I love it. We love it in, you know, in our students in the end, and we graduate, and they go through that. But as you're living it, there's a lot of energy that you're going to expend. Sue, the next slide. Okay, so your role, whether you're new or maybe um, you came out of the role, you're coming back in, you need to know your responsibilities. The bottom line is you are going to be evaluated. Some places have rubrics for part-time evaluation. Some places are developing this rubric. You uh, may have seen it if you're recently in a hospital setting, there's peer evaluations. A rubric is a, a grading kind of format, maybe Likert scale, maybe five to 10 items. So your evaluation is going to be tied to what your, what your, what is your job description? In my, um, again, going into what I do in first semester, I teach first semester fundamentals, foundations. We have lab and clinical. We have lab responsibilities in clinical. Medical surgical students may only be in clinical. So what is your responsibility? Yes, that is also your job description is tied to how you're being paid, but it should be clear. Everyone deserves, whether you're clinical faculty, part-time, full-time, a job description. And then clearly within that job description is your role expectations. What do I mean by role expectations? Well, we're in the middle of identifying um, right now all our learning management systems, our Blackboard um, for elementary or higher ed students, I believe that's Schoology, right? So there's a platform now where we can get our outlines. Are you responsible for putting outlines in? Are you responsible in your role to entering grades? And when do you need to do that? What is the role expectation for you? We talked about the handbook a little while ago. The handbook is key. If possible, if you don't have it already and you're starting, we start August 28th and you're starting soon, you should be getting that handbook. Hopefully it's printed. Everything now is sent online as a PDF. Understand that handbook. You probably will not have your nursing program chairperson or maybe even the coordinator. There's usually a chairperson in each program or a dean if you have it. They probably won't have time to share and go through that in detail. But usually you may be assigned to someone who's a faculty, faculty resource mentor to go through that handbook. Ask for the handbook. The handbook is vital to you and to understand it. For example, for me, the most important part of the handbook is tardy and attendance. You will have in your clinical instructor role attendance issues. In most programs, it's two days or one day. I mean, all states, I see that we have a wide variety of attendance and participants from California, Florida. Every state is different. So understand uh, the expectations of your clinical attendance, communication path, all of those. Now, this last bullet is email messages. We're all, you know, you're not unique. We're all now communicating using email, using text messages. If your school does that as with your faculty, most likely it's going to be communication primarily through an email platform. Check your emails. Your coordinator may be sending you emails, messages. There may be alerts about a student. Um, right now I'm getting messages if there are any problems with health requirements for our agencies. Agencies are requiring at least three to four weeks or even sometimes months ahead now. Uh, information like CPR, vaccinations, et cetera. And they want that before the students get placed in their clinical practice site. If the student can't be reached and it's summertime, everybody's not really checking on their, you know, students have various emails they'll tell you. They usually need gentle reminders to say, hey, start checking, please, to your college email. But for us as faculty, most of our coordinators, our supervisors do ask that we are um, checking email messages 
And then the other question regarding email messages is what's your commitment? If a student sends you an email Monday, how you know quick are you to respond? In some schools that is addressed, in some schools it isn't. Um, I believe in the past, it's a 48 hour window. So if someone sends you an email on Monday, courtesy is for that, you answer that student by Wednesday. Grading also has certain windows and things. So you may see explicit and maybe not so explicit messages and communication. And just, again, you want to establish that, take a lot of notes if you're getting all that information. But this is certain things that I think is, is really important as we try, get into the clinical instructor role, being the professional that we are, the communication, knowing this policies. And if we know what we're doing and we're competent, you know what? The student's going to probably listen to us better. At least we're hoping, right? All right. The next one, please, Sue. All right. Um, how do I put this in this slide? I've already said the reality of our role as a clinical instructor is that the challenges are the students. We have all different students, right? And we're bringing the students to clinical practice settings. We have to be onboarded to the school requirements. Um, for example, if an incident happens, I've had multiple students from my decades of experience with them in hospitals and practice settings, they forget to eat. I, do, I go to days with them. If somebody forgets to eat, 10 o'clock, we're maybe doing, I've had multiple students and those of you in, on screen here, even though I can't see you, are probably gonna smile. I'm sure you've had dizziness, vertigo, and someone passing out on you, right? So what is your responsibility if that happens? If that happens, are you responsible to call someone at the school? Not only your coordinator in a med surge program, but are you supposed to notify public safety? Okay, what is the legal? You know, so there's legal ties to this, right? So this onboarding to the school is going through the scenario. And then you may not even ask all the questions because you don't know them, but knowing the role of the, and that's really who your mentor should be in terms of helping you. They should assist you with all various scenarios. They should assist you with any problem solving. And again, when you start, you will not be able to anticipate any of this because things change. Had things happen, issues happen as they come. Onboarding to the clinical site and hospital, Sue and I firmly believe that you need to also go visit your clinical practice setting. Not just visit University of Pittsburgh, that just popped in my head, that was my clinical placement area, huge hospital. It's probably still a huge hospital. Lost, first day, didn't know. So I had to go to the floor that, you know, level two, this wing. We also used to go to hospital center in DC, MedStar Washington Hospital Center, huge places. I can't expect my students to understand it if I haven't toured it. And then not only am I expected as a clinical instructor to know the place, to know the location, I need to get to know the staff, the people. Those people work there. They have a routine. And you know what I tell my students, and this is my MO, we're visitors. You all strange students with the scrub colors, whatever color they are, we visit. And we're all strangers, visitors. We are not part of that practice setting. So we look foreign, different. So how do we get that relationship? The key is relationship so that our students are safe. And they're working with patients that we also want to keep safe. The hospitals, they're hospitals. The practice settings, where the community agencies. Yes, they all are having uh, safety that we need to safeguard, you know, and have those issues, prevention of this, infection, falls, but we also need to take care of our students. So the onboarding is key. Challenges, know your agency policies. Where do your students kind of, Sue kind of mentioned it in terms of what rooms, what computers, where can you... Oh, what microwave can you use if you're allowed to use one for lunch breaks? 
are you even allowed in the in the staff room? You know, and, and there's a lot. I know and I hear from multiple friends from other states that there's a lot of goodness and then also a little bit of conflict with nurses from time to time. That's the reality. But the reality is we're the conduits. We, the clinical faculty, the main instructor, can't be in conflict with anybody. We have to, again, our goal is to have this kind of rotation for everybody and everything to be good. So expect the personalities, which we all have, right? Some are better than others. Some have better days than others. We've all gone through that as a nurse. And then understand, so spend some time and understand the staff expectations. Those are key. Okay. Next one, Sue. So my last and next to the last one will be scenarios. Communicate well. Find out if it's if you are now assigned and you're new and you're going to start on in the next few weeks and barking on this clinical instructor role, who is going to show you around? Is it the coordinator? Is it part of the course team, the coordinator and the faculty? Will you be assigned a faculty mentor? My school where I'm teaching now, they're they're doing these different various things, which they're having a mentor within the program and then outside the program. But you need to have um, all of that communicated with you in, in written documents and handouts. You need to have access to certain platforms to get all that information. Course coordinators are key. You will need to contact your course coordinator, your supervisor in the event of an issue. What kind of issue? Your student never showed up for clinical. Um, there was a safety course, not a med error, but there was a safety violation. A something um, fell off the bed, something fell off, an IV line, an IV, um, an IV medlock accidentally um, got taken out. And your and a staff nurse was upset and got yelled at our one of our students wasn't our students so there's a lot of issues that we can spend uh, multiple hours with you with and there'll be issues you'll encounter communications again with the agencies you have to find that path so the coordinator if they're introducing you to hospital A or communicate community community site or agency A is going to have a main contact person. That main contact person usually is an educator or someone that's assigned to be with students. There's multiple names and roles. Most hospitals don't want five different schools to be communicating with them with five different ways. So there's usually a set path. They call them a liaison. We call them a, um, an educator, a placement coordinator for the hospital, whatever it is you need to get access for that. And you're not going to be the one just going to the hospital. Hopefully your coordinator will facilitate that path for you. All right. And then, so our last slide is for us to just do some interaction if you can, if anyone's encountered any of this, um, you know, so the first one, student fails to submit the assignment, horrible, horrible, on the due date. You've established a due date. Maybe a time. I'm. I've been doing this, so I'm only. A, I'm always establishing a date, Thursday, a time. Uh, I put that all specifically. You can either collect it. It used to be in the past we would collect it when we physically saw them at the clinical site. Now we can either have it emailed. The other option, and I'm sure a lot of your schools have it. You can use your learning management system, and you have a little place there to just for the students to upload. So if anyone is willing to um, answer, first one fails to submit on the, the due date, what's your first, what do you think your first? And we have, I see questions here now too. We'll definitely get to them after this. I'm going to write that down. Someone asked a question on falling asleep in clinical. Mm. Um, this one right here, and, and Sue, you can also interject. I mm. like going to the student. I, I saw that as an answer. Fails to submit the assignment. What do you do? Speak to the student privately. Thank you, Olivia, for that. Find out what, find out what happened. 
privately is best. Yep. Now you will have students, well, we have this and I believe we call it a pattern. There are students that are gonna give you red flags because this is a constant pattern. But I've had students who failed to submit the assignment because their mother was hospitalized and they didn't wanna share. Mm -hmm. Their mother was going through a terminal illness. So this question right here, you have to individualize. If, if a student has failed us to submit the assignment, go search that, seek that student. Sometimes they won't seek you. I'm sorry, they won't. And I love that. Praise in public, discuss concerns in private, definitely. Absolutely. I, yeah. I would just add, if it's a pattern, then you really need from the beginning to document and then let your coordinator know. Because the earlier you address things if it's a pattern in a more formal way, documentation, really the better for everyone. You can't let it go to the last day of the clinical rotation and have a student not submit most of their assignments. By that date, it's too late. They haven't met the objective. So in fairness to them and to you in your own protection, definitely document from day one and let your coordinator know if you see it, repeat it in any way. Okay. I also like that someone mentioned a disciplinary tool. In my program, we have what's called a um, counseling form. So if there is any lateness, uh, a student handbook, a policy violation, et cetera, we have to, we are required to write a counseling form, which is explained to the students on their very first day. So even if this is regarding a st extenuating circumstance, they got into an accident, something is going on at home, we still have to write it up, mm -hmm. but we have to do it gently. And, and the first thing again is putting that, let me speak to you, my student first. Going on to the second one, students upset with a patient or a patient family members and seeks you to discuss what are your next three steps. So you will have this in clinical settings. Someone's upset the student, a family member or the actual patient. Could be various scenarios, so many vast and various and, and different things you may see. This again requires your attention. And it may require you to change an assignment. So this is again something that, and our reality, my reality in Maryland is that our clinical, I teach up to nine students. I know in some states there's, they've capped that. So I'm not in medical surgical, I'm in more community agencies and long-term care settings. I have nine at a time. If there is an issue, we do it privately. And then we talk and I get all the information as much as possible. And this one, if patient family members, it was there was a staff personnel involved, I have to get the full story. And then of course, maybe changing an assignment, changing that setting if there's something upsetting. Um, it depends, again, on the situation. You have to get the full story. Can't react quickly. There is no, again, blaming or anybody in trouble for anything. And then if there's something that it's uh, a critical event, you may have to involve a manager at the agency. You will also have to probably, most likely, report this to your coordinator if it has to be taken above it. And it may, okay, depending on the scenario. Um, because of time, and we want to get to your questions, the last one. Um, the student requests that you write them a letter of recommendation. Most clinical instructors, that is part of your job description, and most employers want the recommendations from the clinical instructors, not the classroom. And I spoke to someone who hires at a, a, a major healthcare system here, and they said they put about 30% of their decision on hiring on these letters, these clinical letters of recommendation. So one of your students who was pretty weak wants you to write the letter of recommendation. What do you do? Okay. Um, you really don't have to write that letter. In a very kind way, you would say that, in your opinion, they would be best served by going to a different clinical instructor than you because in your sight, you felt that that was not an area of strength for them. They may have really struggled and then they think that that is someplace they want to work 
and they may, in your opinion, need more experience before they're able to do that type of clinical setting. You're more than welcome to say you're great, you're going to be great, but I wouldn't start in the ER if I were you. You know, I would start in a calmer area. You really need experience first. So you really need to kind of have a line or two that you send out and say you do not have to because in our area, it's not just a letter of reference. You will get a survey of 25 to 30 questions where you have to rate them on a Likert scale and they go into great detail. And you do not want to be in the position of having not to tell the truth, not tell the truth and also give somebody all ones on a Likert scale. So we can go to our next slide. I think this is it. So we can go to. My computer decided to take a break. It's tired of listening to me. Um, ah, here we go. Good. Okay. Oh, questions. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So Susan and Eden, this was amazing. People love this webinar. You have provided excellent and information and, and delivered an informative presentation. Um, we're going to go ahead and take some questions now. Just as a reminder, if anybody has any additional questions, please type them into the Q&A box on your Zoom control panel. Um, the first question we had was from Terry, who asked, have you ever had a student fall asleep in clinical and how was that handled? I had a student, Terry, who um, fell asleep in a room. She went into a supply room and I found her asleep. Um, I documented it. I talked to her. You know, she said she wasn't feeling well, etc. But I did need to talk to my coordinator, and I did do that, carry those numbers with you. And um, the coordinator and myself and the student met. And sadly, it was the last day of this student's clinical rotation, and she was a senior. So, and she wasn't the strongest student. So in our facility, we added a clinical day for that student with specific objectives. and. Uh, Myself and the student spent another clinical day together with the objective of, you know, uh, staying awake, me observing her, doing care for the patient. But that is something you really need to address immediately. It's one thing to fall asleep in a classroom. We've all done that. But in clinical, no, it's a patient safety issue and you have to act immediately. Great. The second question was, from Haydar, who asked, it is sometimes intern students, when they reach halfway through the practicum, they become a bit lazy. They feel bored for me. As So as a clinical instructor, how can I make them energetic and persuade them to try to uh, continue having best practice skills, even though they uh, have already done, they've already been practicing skills for a while? So is this in a lab setting or clinical setting? So it sounds, I, and I don't know if you have um, simulation opportunities. Um, we have, and, and someone can add on that if they add on it, Lee. So in our program, in my program, I'm very, very, very lucky to have um, simulation center. We can either do something dynamic and, and get students involved in a simulation, more complex scenario. And again, simulation is in a safe environment, correct? Um, there is also a various products from various companies that have um, basically simulation kind of um, avatars. So is that a possibility to to maybe bring that in a Zoom or a Teams kind of Google platform and you and your students do it as in a group activity. Something more challenging, maybe it would be, for example, if you're doing a, you know, some programs have med surge and then an advanced med surge. Maybe advance it a little bit, take it in more advanced setting, somebody more complex maybe with a gastrointestinal issue that's bleeding with some shock. So I'd say technology, you know, from the 
from what I've seen, um, again, in teaching this long with, with various types of students, especially this new generation, they love technology. They want to do more with tech. They're constantly showing me the other ways they're learning some of the theory content because it's in a YouTube or it's in a TikTok. That's my answer. Just challenge them if possible. I would add just briefly, I would up what you expect them to do. Maybe have a daily worksheet that by the end of the clinical day, they need to complete with specific information you think is important for them. They need practice and learning how to get information from the clinical site on their own, because that will be their life as a nurse. Maybe change it around that one's a team leader and responsible for the other students, and they need to make sure everything's being done. Maybe they need more a care for more patients, okay? Not just one patient, maybe two. Definitely up the ante. They themselves really often need guidance. And a little push back to that quote, poke with a stick. You really need to up the ante lots of times with your students. So I hope that's helpful. That's great. Um, Kristen asked, what do I cover in post-conference and how do I keep the students interested after a long clinical day? Oh, that's perfect. That's a great, great question. You have to read the room. Sometimes it's the topic could be something psychosocial. How did we feel today, everybody? And just go around and ask. It could have been something traumatic. We were helping someone and then they fell. And then we had to call paramedics. And because I'm in community agency, we have to call out. How did you all feel in that role? And we go through the maybe the emotional aspects of it. So it depends on your setting. And then sometimes, you know, I have the students select. If you give them opportunities and, and maybe a first semester versus a third semester or a third year students different, make them in charge of some of this. Um, I like someone, Kim, you just put their NCLEX categories. That's wonderful. We, we address that. Do a, a tomorrow we are going to do um, basic care and comfort. Your answers have to be basic care. I'm going to give you scenarios. Make it tomorrow, next Tuesday, we're going to do pharmacology. So, but then also invite their participation. Sue, were you going to ask add something? I, um, our students present medication presentations as part of their clinical and post-conference, especially the medications they're learning in the classroom, which cor correlate with the clinical. So they do a presentation and part of the presentation is they find about five NCLEX questions and they present that to the students in post-conference. It helps them with their exams. It helps them with learning content. They're engaged. The more you can shift to the students to do presentations, their patient, do SBAR, the really better. And also a question you can always have the students uh, answer in post-conference, what conversation, what encounter did you witness between a professional caregiver and a patient that you thought was positive and therapeutic? And the caregiver was very present with the patient because often we're not present with patients. Listen to that. What conversation did you also hear that where you felt the caregiver was not present? And how could that change? And how might you avoid that? Get them to start to think ahead of what life is like. It's not, you're not there to criticize those staff nurses. You don't know what's going on in their lives, but you're getting them to prepare for what they'll do in that situation. Ellen just posted in the chat. She asked, what is the best way to handle a male patient who is making inappropriate gestures and comments to a female student nurse, either the same age group or not, or a female patient, male student nurse in the same scenario? I had, uh, we went to a nursing home in one facility, one um, university where I worked, and the uh, females who had uh, a little bit of cognitive decline were making suggestive comments to the male student that I had. And so basically, 
he needed to have a female student with him when he was encountering, even though on one hand you could say, oh, she's like 82 and she's cognitive decline, quote, back in the day, people may say, oh, isn't that cute? It's not cute. It is harassment. And yes, she has cognitive decline. So he always was with another female student. And if it did get an inappropriate, then I would advise him just to leave. I would not assign him to that student. So that's my example. Yes, in most programs in your schools, there's a behavior incident report that you need to be filled out if this quantifies and, and it's you kind of it's a pretty um, clear form. You would also need to talk to someone at your, so if it happened in clinical, it probably needs to also report it to your school. I had something similar where student A touched student B, student B reported and felt offended about it. Although they were friends, they carpooled together. So it was a, uh, a difficult somewhat uh, issue, but it had to go through the separate and we had to pull everybody together and talk. Great, we have time for one more question. And this is from Justin. If the coordinator supervisor assigned to me is unreachable, who can I contact to address this urgent question regarding a student issue? What recommendations do you, do you all have? If your coordinator, if that is, if you say you're part of a medical surgical course and you have a coordinator and that coordinator is unavailable, you may have to go um, up the chain of command if there is a, an associate dean or your dean for nursing. Um, in, in your program, at your orientation, if you're onboarding to your school, you will be meeting with the dean if there is a the dean of the school of nursing, and then maybe a, a counterpart um, with that person, administration, and then you'll be onboarded with the course and the coordinate, coordinator. And in most schools that I'm familiar and have uh, worked with, that is usually the chain of command. They want you, they will be able to give you all their contact information. You should, and, and, he, and they know, they do track, because you usually have to send your schedules to the administrative person so they know Eden is over here on Monday, Sue's on Tuesday, because it goes the other way too. If something happens, hospitals, um, we used to go to a hospital where one of the presidents used to go to, so we would be called on our route, an hour drive to get there. Hey, they're just saying no students are allowed at this hospital. So the, they had to find all of us wherever we were. So that should be the communication path. Excellent. Susan, if you can go to the next slide, please. This will be information for everybody attending today. Um, if you're interested in purchasing a single copy of um, Eden and Susan's new book, The Fast Facts for Clinical Nursing Instructor, fourth edition, you can buy that at springerpub.com. Um, it looks like we've covered all of the questions from the um, folks who have attended today. We thank you all again for spending the time with us this afternoon. And of course, a big, big thanks again to Eden and Susan for such a wonderful presentation. If any of you are interested in purchasing the book, Fast Facts for the Clinical Nursing Instructor, fourth edition, you can see here, again, there's a discount 25% off the list price. If you use the code webinar24 at checkout on www w.springerpub.com. A reminder, the recorded session will be available on springerpub.com within five to seven business days. We will also be sending the recording to all of you. Multiple folks mentioned in the chat they were interested in getting a copy of the recording. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us. You'll get our contact information in your follow-up email. And finally, we want to wish everyone a great afternoon, and we look forward to you joining us in the future for another Springer Publishing webinar. Thanks, and have a great day. Thank yeah, you. Our, our contact information is around, too, and you can get our information and ask us any questions. Thank and you, we everybody. Can, we can share that with Thank everybody you. today. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.